spoiler alert, the following material contains spoilers. Woe to you of Earth and Sea. Welcome to Satan is My Superhero, a show about art, culture, history and the devil. I'm your host, Judas Falling. In this episode, we will be looking for our favourite superhero in science fiction. A popular way the devil shows up in sci-fi is through the Christ myth. Let's begin with the quiz-essential sci-fi Christ myth, Star Wars. Excuse me, Judas, but technically... I know Star Wars is more fantasy than sci-fi, but you know, I want to talk about Star Wars. So let's look at some of the comparisons that can be made between the most commercially successful science fiction epic ever and Star Wars. Stop it. Starting at the very beginning, which is obviously episode four, A New Hope, we learn the... Biblically named... Alien Luke of dubious parentage has supernatural abilities. Luke is called upon by divine inspiration. He is the chosen one. He must rescue the galaxy from an evil empire in the hands of a sinister tyrant and his left-hand man, Darth Vader. Here we have a tight fit for Satan and his Antichrist, except the Antichrist turns out to be the Boy Wonder's dad, so Star Wars has left the Bible trail here. Unless... It's Mary, isn't it? Ah, yes, but I'm sorry, I don't think I know you. Oh, no. You don't know me yet. I'm on the, um, Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's it. I'm the Holy Spirit. That's me. Vader offers Luke ultimate power. Here we have a return to scripture where Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and ironically, Luke. Then Vader murders the Emperor to save Luke and Vader dies. We have left scripture completely. In the prequels, we learn Darth Vader is of dubious, possibly supernatural parentage himself. He is another chosen one who falls from grace. He is arrogant and having superior powers to his contemporaries fills him with hubris. He strikes out against his fellow angelic Jedi and is banished to the dark side. Which has more than a whiff of the Satan story about it. Dead Jedi become ghosts. Darth Maul looks like the devil. Jar Jar Binks speaks in tongues. The Deveronians look exactly like red two-horned devils. And Darth Vader is dressed all in black all the time. How much more satanic imagery do you need? The funniest thing I saw was people upset by the overtly sexual relationship between C-3PO and R2-D2. I hope those perverts separate their refrigerator and dishwasher at night. But what I find the most interesting is the thing that gets the most comment. People of faith, but not enough to have it challenged, hate the Force more than the Emperor, Darth Vader or Jar Jar Binks. The Force is the most blasphemous thing in the franchise. Son, can you help me? I need to move the refrigerator away from the dishwasher. Sure, if you just hold that side while I force myself in here. Did you just use the F word? Um, yeah, sorry. Get to the spanking chair right now and you pray Jesus didn't hear you. Can you get the refrigerator off me first? Why don't you use the force, devil child? As far as the Christian references in the Star Wars movies goes, you can find them if you want them to be there, but ultimately George Lucas is drawing from a broad base of mythology. You can find just as many references to the other mythologies if you look. The idea of a chosen one, a demigod, not exactly God, but more than human with supernatural powers coming to rescue us all from evil, is not exclusive to the Abrahamic religions. Depending on how long a bow you want to draw, you could argue it's almost universal. Mr. Lucas did not confine himself to Judeo-Christian mythology. He used all of them. And four billion dollars later, people are still asking why. Many enthusiasts will tell you Star Wars borrows a lot from Frank Herbert's seminal sci-fi epic, Dune. It certainly shares a Christ figure as its main character. Biblically named... Paul Atreides, a.k.a. Muad'Dib, has supernatural powers and is the prophesied Kwisatz Hederach. Herbert gives us science behind these fantastical powers. The supernatural abilities Paul displays are not random or an act of divine intervention. They are a result of genetic manipulation and a multi-generational breeding program. Even the prophecy of this Quizrat Hederach has been placed in society and nurtured for thousands of years by the Ben Gesset witches who are behind it all. Paul's abilities are not far removed from what we would describe as the Force. Well, <laughs> hey, enough of the F word! The main antagonist is Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, an obese hedonistic sadist, rebuilding his family's wealth and power after a fall from grace a generation or two ago. The Baron makes for an unsympathetic, ravenous devil. He's not the eloquent, charismatic Satan we're all used to. He's not a tragically flawed idealist like Vader, or a devotee of the dark arts like Palpatine. Harkonnen is a proper beast. 
He is a wild animal. This guy is so morbidly obese, he is kept alive and afloat by technology. He is covered in pus, dripping sores, his own vomit and other people's blood. And he's a pedophile rapist. I can't wait to see how he will be betrayed in the 21st century film version. His nephew and heir to the throne, Fade Ruther, is part of the same breeding program Paul comes from, but has not harnessed the same powers. He's a failed Quizrat Hederach, and not a bad fit for an Antichrist. He was played by Sting in the much maligned 1984 movie. Are you still watching that bloody movie? Yep, just waiting for the credits so I can see who made it. Ah, here we go, finally. Alan Smythe, who the Uh, f*** is Alan Smythe? In the sequel novels, Paul leads a holy war of death and destruction throughout the universe, bending humanity to the will of his new religion. Hey, Zeus would never do that. I found this quote from Frank Herbert himself. All men must see that the teaching of religion by rules and rote is largely a hoax. Herbert wholeheartedly paints religious faith as a superstition manipulated by the elites to control the greater populace. Herbert's books are drenched in religion and politics and where they intersect. Paul becomes disillusioned with the holy galactic empire he has created and goes off the rails. His son attains godlike superpowers and goes off the rails too. All the way through the journeys of Paul and his human-slash-god hybrid son Leto, Herbert quietly reminds you now and then that millions upon millions of people are dying for it. Herbert's Christ figure does far more damage to the human race than his antagonists could have dreamed of. I think Frank Herbert's Christ is also his antichrist. It's brilliant. Speaking of brilliant, The Matrix brings all manner of mythology and legend together, and yes, there is a Christ figure and multiple biblical references, but just like Lucas, the Wachowskis cast a very wide mysticism net. Keanu Reeves begins the film as the... Biblically named... Thomas. Thomas Anderson. The name Anderson has a Greek connection to mean son of man, which is exactly how JC often referred to himself. Zion is the location of the final holy battle in both the Matrix series and Revelation. Morpheus makes an excellent John the Baptist, and Cypher is a good Judas Iscariot. Agent Smith and his fellow agents have the ability to possess innocent people just like demons. Neo dies and is resurrected. It's all there, but if you need more, the internet can deliver. There's a plaque on the... Ship Nebuchadnezzar that reads Mark 3, number 11, which people on the net like to think might reference Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God! Praise the Lord! At one point in the film, a character says, Hallelujah! You're my saviour, man! My own personal Jesus Christ. Also, according to the internet, Agent Smith's number plate is IS5416, which could relate to Isaiah 54, verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. I hope that one's true. I think the Wachowskis created a perfect arch-villain who simply grows more powerful, more insane, and more human in every film. Smith is a great Satan. In the beginning, he is used like the accuser in Job. He is a tool of the creator. He then realizes his creator is not omnipotent, rebels, obtains great knowledge and power, and brings war and destruction to that creator. The only one who can stop him is the Christ figure Neo, and only through ultimate sacrifice. Neo is my Jesus. John Connor, or JC to his friends, is the Christ figure in the Terminator universe. Biblically named. John has a strange time loop paradoxal birth, where he is the man who sent his own father back in time to impregnate his mum. Gross! John is the only one who can save humanity from the cold, soulless, tyrannical Skynet. I'm waiting to buy shares. The T-800, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, is the Antichrist sent back in time to kill John's mother, Sarah Connor. Kyle Reese is sent back to protect Sarah and tell her she is going to be impregnated with the Chosen One. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Then Kyle impregnates her, more conventionally than the way the Bible just described it. In the sequel, the T-1000 is an updated shape-shifting robot that, like Satan, can assume different identities. 
the T-1000 also ends up being cast into a lake of molten metal. Why always molten? I don't know if James Cameron's bad guys are good analogues for the devil. They are soulless and without personality. That's the point. They can't be reasoned with. It makes the fight against them even more hopeless and unfair. This war, John, so hopeless and unfair. Yeah, I know, Kyle. I know. Hey, here's a picture of my mum. What do you think? She's pretty hot, right? Um... There's no hiding Superman's parallels with Christ, an only son of an otherworldly being sent to Earth to help humans. In the 1978 movie, Marlon Brando, playing Jor-El, the father of Superman, quotes the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. After arriving on Earth, baby Superman is adopted by Jonathan and Martha. Did you say Joseph and Mary? It's these damned flies. Superman spends his early years hiding his powers, then goes to his fortress of solitude, replicating the time Jesus spent in the desert before beginning his crime-fighting career around the age of 30. Superman is Jesus in tights, sands the fishes and loaves. Superman also gets stabbed in the side, just like Jesus in one of the more recent films. Superman nails the Christ figure. Don't do puns. But on the Antichrist side of the scales, Hollywood favours Lex Luthor, who, you know, does change costumes, assumes identities, lies, and seeks to usurp all powers that be with his superior knowledge and technology, but, you know... Let's play superheroes versus supervillains. Cool, I'm Superman and you're Lex Luthor. Bam! I just pulverized you into a puddle of red juice on the ground. You're dead. Now let's play a video game. Another common way Satan turns up in sci-fi is as an alien that has visited in our past and inspired the devil myth. Yes, that's right. Ancient alien style. The Arthur C. Clarke novel Childhood's End is about a race of aliens who have cloven hooves, serpent tails, dragon wings, and have been visiting Earth forever. They have accidentally placed themselves in the human psyche. Did any of the Earthlings see you? No, they were distracted by some kind of demon. Oh dear. In 1971, Doctor Who travels to the small English town of Devil's End, where archaeologists are excavating the Devil's Hump. They unearth an ancient devil-looking alien called Azul, who, at the end of the episode, explodes after witnessing a selfless act. So, yeah, that alien had issues. In a 2006 two-parter, Doctor Who meets The Beast in the episodes Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit. This two-horned alien claims to have been imprisoned on a planet orbiting a black hole before the creation of the universe, which makes no sense at all. Now you start questioning Doctor Who? The Doctor eventually casts the beast into the black hole and then escapes the black hole that was created before time began in his time machine that, you know, looks like a telephone box. People love that show. I see them complaining about it all the time. In the 1973 Star Trek animated series, the episode The Magics of Megas 2 is about a planet inhabited by witches. These beings had visited Earth in the 17th century and found themselves in the Salem Witch Trials. An inhabitant on this planet is called Lucian, who turns out to be... Lucifer. Do you have any idea how hard it was for me to break into the Saturday morning cartoon market? I had to do things. (gasps) <gasps> Let's go, boy! I'm going to take a short break from the show right now to talk about my sponsors and Patreon. I don't currently have sponsors or Patreon, but if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by buying my novel. It's called Chaos Machine by Judas Fawley. It's available through Amazon. You don't need a Kindle to read it. Almost any digital device will do. Don't forget, Chaos Machine by Judas Fawley. Now, back to the show. As a young man, legendary sci-fi author Philip K. Dick saw a terrifying vision of an eyeless being in the sky that, well, terrified him. He met with his local priest, who confirmed to Phil it was definitely the devil. Phil then converted to Christianity and started attending church. For a while. Philip wrote a number of sci-fi pieces containing satanic characters. In Deuce Array, a character whose name translates to Air Devil, is the head of a new religion taking over the remnants of humanity after a devastating nuclear war. In The Divine Invasion, Yahweh is exiled from Earth to another planet after the fall of Masada in 74 CE. Belial rules the world. I think that's all the dick we need for now. Thank you. He also talked a lot about Satan in his 8,000-page compilation of handwritten journal entries published after his death. That's enough. Seriously, I think I speak for everyone when I say, that's enough, dick. He wrote about a secret Roman empire. His theory goes Satan took over Rome in the first century and is still secretly running the world. Preposterous. 
Where's the stop button? How do I stop this recording? If you're wondering what drugs Phil may have been on at the time, the answer is all of them. That's right, it was the drugs. He didn't know anything about anything. In the 1978 Battlestar Galactica, they had a Cylon called Lucifer, who was in charge of tracking down the colonial fleet and destroying the last of humanity. In a two-parter, War of the Gods Part 1 and War of the Gods Part 2, the crew of the Galactica encounter Count Iblis on a red planet. Iblis is a character from the Quran who is often compared to the Christian Satan. Oh, I just adore Iblis. Count Iblis has supernatural powers and tricks and lies to the crew before angelic-like beings who appear as pure light rescue our heroes from Count Iblis and his diabolical plans. Creator of Battlestar Galactica, Glenn A. Larson, is a Mormon, and the show is said to contain Church of the Latter-day Saints references. You know, if the Mormons drop the push bikes and white shirts for vipers and colonial uniforms... Good afternoon, ma'am. Have you heard about the book of... Is that your spaceship? Yes, ma'am. Sign me up! So I thought it fitting to end this episode with the best, and ironically, the first. In 1816, an 18-year-old Mary Shelley began work on Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, believed by many to be the first science fiction novel. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. The monster in Frankenstein is often likened to John Milton's lonely, depressed and tragically rejected by his creator Satan. Shelley was an unashamed fan of Milton and her monster even reads and references Paradise Lost. I think the whole novel is wonderfully satanic. Dr. Victor Frankenstein defies the teachings of the church and tries to create life itself. Victor tries to be as God. Victor defies God. This is Garden of Eden level sin. It's a cautionary tale about messing with nature. Shelley was living in an age of wonderful ideas and inventions. It was all just starting to kick off. Humanity was challenging and taming nature in all sorts of new ways. Frankenstein gets his comeuppance for defying God and the poor monster suffers for the sin of being created. It's really bleak, and Shelley makes you love the monster without ever sugarcoating the malice in its broken heart. So if I'm judging science fiction's best analogue for Satan, Mary Shelley wins the award twice. You kind of get two lovable, lonely, tragic, God-defying, murderous Satans for the price of one. You also get left with a question about the responsibility of creator to creation. The monster's created and then abandoned in the world and left to fend for itself. The monster's god is deaf, dumb, and blind to its plight. When it comes to the satanic science fiction novel, Mary Shelley did it first, and for my money, she did it best. And to add to Shelley's satanic credentials, her husband, Percy Shelley, and their close friend, the mad, bad, and dangerous-to-know Lord Byron, were dubbed the Satanic School by poet Robert Southey, because their work was characterized by a satanic spirit of pride and audacious impiety. The first ape to climb down out of the tree had a spirit of pride and audacious impiety. And that's why Satan is my superhero. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, subscribe, you know the drill. But more importantly, please recommend this show to just one person. I mean literally one person. Choose that person well. Characterized by a satanic spirit of pride and audacious. Characterized by a satanic spirit of pride and audacious impiety. Characterized by a. That that was a bot. (laughs) Characterized by a satanic spirit of pride and audacious impiety.